Trace Mayer, who shared the story of Bitcoin when it was $1 a coin, is a legend in this sector. Through his various websites, ventures, and podcasts, he is one of the most recognized people in the industry. In fact, he is so influential that we create an entire exclusive report, not found anywhere else, with every forecast and achievement he has pulled off in a few short years. Go to PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash trace right now, where his history of accurate ideas is laid out in full. Welcome to Cryptocurrencies, the future of digital money show at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Joining us today is one of my favorite guests. He is a Bitcoin investor who has funded much of Bitcoin's infrastructure, including Armory for Bitcoin wallets, BitPay, and Kraken. He is one of the original pioneer investors in this sector. He is also the host of the very popular Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast, Mr. Trace Mayer. We're welcome Welcoming Trace back to the show today to provide an insight on just what is happening because it appears that we have experienced a kind of bomb inside the cryptocurrency realm going off, sending all coins down by at least 80% and sometimes 100%. ICOs are failing miserably, and the headlines of RIP Bitcoin is everywhere. So let's get past all of this gloom and doom and welcome our guest. Trace, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Oh, perfect timing, too. Uh, we want to get your thoughts right now on what's happening. It seems almost unbelievable to watch how an asset like Bitcoin can go from $20,000 down to $3,500 without any news of critical problems surfacing. But it's not the first time that Bitcoin has done this. So I'd love for us to go through a little bit of your background, how you first got into Bitcoin, what you first purchased it at, and please take us through these bear markets and how they feel because you've been through this several times. Uh, yeah, I've through, been through all of them. So for me, it's, <laughs> not, it's, it's uh, kind of old hat. Right. <laughs> I, I put out a tweet recently about uh, how hodlers of last resort all have gnarly battle wounds and war stories to tell. And so, uh, and, and <laughs> the video, the YouTube that I put on that tweet, it's actually this poor guy went on a hang gliding trip in Switzerland and the, the pilot forgot to strap him in on the harness. So wow. he, was, he was literally like holding on for dear life, right? <laughs> for a couple minutes, uh, flying around for uh, two, like a couple thousand feet above the ground. The uh, but, that, but that can be what it feels like for the uninitiated, for the right. new people into the Bitcoin space. And a lot of people, they, they take this, uh, they get shaken out for whatever reason. Uh, maybe they over allocated themselves maybe they just don't have the stomach to hold on and you know that's too bad for them because <laughs> i mean look at look at past history we've had multiple crashes all like this one time we had it go down 30 percent in a couple hours uh in 2013 like if you get shaken out if you if you lack the conviction if you lack the financial strength and mental discipline and emotional discipline to be able to hold a position because you just don't have conviction then you know like i kind of look at it as good riddance because i'm in there buying at at times like these uh you know when the mayor multiple gets below 0. 0.6 it's just like free money as far as i'm concerned and I was actually trying to get a deal done uh, yesterday where I would purchase a June 2020 5K strike call options on Bitcoin. And so, you know, that would, based on the premium that we were negotiating and everything, it would basically enable me to about 4X the return relative to buying just Bitcoin itself with the same amount of capital. And so now that we've got these derivative markets that are coming online, Ledger X has been open for over a year. Backed is coming online. NASDAQ has talked about it. Fidelity wants to move into the space. Like, really? Does it, does it have that much further to go down than $3,500? And when you're looking at a 0.53 mayor multiple, it's been higher than that 98% of the time. Like, just statistically, 
it's very much in your favor for, for some type of short-term mean reversion correction. Uh, I guess it could keep going down, but it's just not statistically very probable. And so, you know, that's how I approach this and how I have approached this uh, for about a decade now. I mean, Bitcoin's not new. Bitcoin's a decade old right. next month. Like people who don't understand it, who haven't done the research, who haven't figured out how to buy it and secure it and hold it, mm -hmm. like they're just being lazy, <laughs> procrastinating. They're allocating their resources where they think they'll get a better return. And so when this, as this wealth transfer continues to happen, I just am getting less and less sympathetic or empathetic to people on that side of the trade mm -hmm. because this is a zero-sum game. There are a limited number of Satoshis on the Bitcoin blockchain. Like you're either going to get some or you're not. And if you don't have any, like, and it does become something, you haven't hedged yourself. That was one of the first things that Satoshi talked about is that you, you might want to get some just in case it becomes something. It could become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so, you know, that's what we're going through. We're going through this price discovery process. We're going through this human capital accumulation process that gives you the optionality to then buy Bitcoins in larger amounts if you want to. And so people who, who haven't availed themselves of this, like, sorry, you know, like you, if you miss out on another 20X or 30X bull run, it's your own fault this time. And it's your own fault if your retirement account doesn't have purchasing power on the other side of this. I mean, it's just the way it's going to be. And yet I think a lot of people also take for granted the generosity and the altruism that a lot in the Bitcoin space have done, like myself, funding software that you could use it with, talking about it publicly. Guess what? The, the wagons are getting circled. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of disinformation and misinformation out in the space. So it's becoming harder and harder for people to hone in on signal as opposed to noise. And there's also financial incentive for people in a rivalrous environment like this with something that's strictly limited in amount to make sure that it's very difficult for people to be able to understand and properly purchase this stuff, right? Because you don't like you want you want to buy the cheap Bitcoin. You don't want other people to buy right. the cheap Bitcoin this because they the drive dip, the price right, up Chase? relative to you. Yeah, this is the dip. I mean, this is it. This is it. how much further down can this go? Well, I mean, I guess it could go to zero technically, <laughs> but I highly doubt it. It just doesn't look very probable. And every day that goes by with Bitcoin continuing to exist and continuing to never have a security issue or incident like the more confidence you can have in it. Now, Trace, is there something in your mind, in your perspective that could cause Bitcoin to fail? Because if we all believe in it 100% that it will succeed and we're all confident in buying it right now to make a fortune, what are the risks, if any, that are involved? Well, I mean, we don't believe in it any more than we believe in physics or mathematics. Right. And sure, there are some issues. We've had to make trade-offs because of, you know, we just don't have formal proofs in, in very obscure areas of, of number theory and, and discrete log and stuff like that. And so we've had to make trade-offs when it comes to anonymity or limited in amountness. Uh, but now we've got side chains that are coming online, things like Liquid. We've got extensibility. We've got Lightning Network. I mean, at the end of the day, like th this is not some like Bitcoin cult where we all just, I believe in my Bitcoin. Like, <laughs> no, I mean, don't trust, verify. Like right. that is our credo. Mm -hmm. That is our that is our credo. Like, don't trust, verify. Like, this is a tool that you're able to interact with regardless of any third parties like this has become a force in nature being able to interact with the bitcoin network it can't just not interact with you it follows certain protocol right it's an right. internet protocol like this is math and this is physics and like and so don't trust verify you know like it it's like gravity i mean do you believe there's gravity like <laughs> I, I, I mean, I guess you could believe there's gravity, but for any practical purpose, if you believe there is not gravity, 
good luck with that. <laughs> you know, shifting gears just a little bit, please talk about BACT, what it is and how important is it? Yeah, so BACT is a new startup that is uh, backed, <laughs> ironically, by the New York Stock Exchange owners, uh, CME, ICE, like, you know, the largest exchanges in the world. I mean, these are the 800-pound gorillas. They've now started backed, and they've done this uh, partnerships with Microsoft and Starbucks. I mean, Starbucks has 15 million people that uses its mobile wallet app for mobile payments. I mean, and so they're, they're going to roll out next day Bitcoin swaps, and then they're going to have different futures, you know, kind of like Ledger X has, puts and call options, and then they're going to be rolling out stuff into Starbucks's wallet or through the Microsoft ecosystem. I mean, imagine if Fortnite's doing microtransactions, settling via Bitcoin, and you're hedging the exchange rate risk on backed with derivatives. I mean, this is six network effect of financialization, first and second and third network effects of uh, speculation, merchants and consumers. Because Bitcoin's the most secure blockchain, that's why they're doing all of this on Bitcoin instead of like <laughs> you know, some other <laughs> uh, just joke <laughs> because we got a lot of jokes in this industry. And, right. and then fifth network effect of developers. I mean, these are going to be developers that are building applications and projects on top of Bitcoin because of all of this financialization infrastructure. So I'm very excited about BACT. I'm very excited about NASDAQ doing the same type of thing. I, Ledger X is already doing it. It's awesome. And then you've got Fidelity that's looking at coming into this industry, too, as a major, major custodian, uh, trillions of dollars. I mean, Bitcoin is tiny. It's, it's immaterial. It's not even a rounding error compared to the pools of capital that these types of institutions can bring in. I mean, it's kind of like, it's kind of like having an orange and a straw and an ocean. <laughs> like, how do you move that capital into something the size of an orange? It doesn't happen. What happens is it's going to, it's going to hugely increase in size. We saw this with gold ETFs, but gold was already a reserve currency asset for central banks. Bitcoin's owned by retail investors largely. I mean, this is, this is, this is going to be insane. <laughs> It's just, it's extraordinary the huge players that are coming in, Trace, and most people don't realize it. Um, many of the people actually that aren't in Bitcoin yet don't realize the major players, you know, um, every bank is coming in, you know, <laughs> it's just extraordinary. Yeah, but, but, but as I said, it's been around for a decade. Right. If, you're not a, if you're not aware, it's your own fault. Hmm. And, and you're going and you're going to pay the price financially for, for your choices. This is about personal responsibility. Educate yourself. It's the, it's the real deal. And this time it's about money, like huge amounts of money at stake. You know, what's your prediction on how fast Bitcoin could rise from here? Because this is admittedly a major dip and it sort of scares everybody in in a way you know except doesn't, doesn't so, scare so, me <laughs> doesn't, <laughs> someone like yourself but someone like myself um what is your prediction time wise for this bounce back and i i'm ironically uh because i've sold call options at very high strike prices because i'd like to see a new crop of bitcoin miners that are more friendly to core instead of these clowns that we have, this entire clown car, I would actually like to see it hum around $3,000 for the next six to 18 months. I was reading a Coindesk article, an estimated 600,000 Bitcoin miners were shut down. They're being sold by the kilo for scrap metal. I think that's wonderful. You know, in order to, in order to cleanse the ecosystem of misallocated capital when it comes to startups, misallocated capital when it comes to uh, mining, misallocated capital when it comes to a whole host of things. We need to have a cleansing of this ecosystem. And then the, guess, what, guess what happens? You can have those Bitcoins transfer to people who are a little bit wiser and better uh, when it comes to allocating their capital. And so what have I been doing? I've been selling covered calls the whole way down 
and I'm using that premium now with the mayor multiple at a low level to reacquire more Bitcoins. And so this is how hodlers of last resort can have compounded growth in their Bitcoin holdings. Now, talk to us a little bit about your mayor multiple, because I know this was a phrase that was coined about a year ago or so, talking about your particular equation, how you calculate. Yeah, so it, it's pretty simple on its face. You take the current price divided by the 200-day moving average, and that gives you a relative price or the mayor multiple. And you can use this for any asset uh, exchange ratios. You know, you could do GE shares and gold. You could do Apple shares and Bitcoin. You could do Apple shares and dollars. Because the problem is that we have a total free-floating currency system worldwide that has no definition. It's a real problem. Bitcoin is a solid definition, the hardest, strictest definition for money that we've ever had. And so I like to use this mayor multiple in order to form what I would kind of look at as confidence bands for when it's expensive versus when it's cheap. For example, in December, when it ran to 20,000, uh, it, was, it was like a 3.7x mayor multiple. It had like 99% of the time that mayor multiple had been lower than that. Right now, last a couple of days ago, when it kind of bottomed in this latest you know, weekly cycle, uh, it hit like 0.53. So 98% of the time, the mayor multiple has been higher. So you know, from this, I would draw confidence bands that at 20,000, it was expensive, very expensive actually. And at 0.53 or $3,600, a couple days ago, it was very cheap. And so, you know, I look at it when it's very expensive. If you're going to sell, that's the time to sell. And when it's very cheap, if you're going to buy, that's the time to buy. And I'm very patient, right. you know, as a hodler of last resort. Like, I'm very, very patient. And so, as long as you have a bank account that can hold US dollars in a safe way, uh, then you know, because the U.S. dollar is a world reserve settlement currency. It's the, it's the big deal, right? right? And so, like, as this liquidity collapse, as this great credit contraction happens that I wrote a book about a decade ago, and it's playing out exactly how I wrote it would in the book, except now we have Bitcoin. You know, I published the book the same week Bitcoin came out. So, Tell everybody the name of the book, Trace. Uh, it's The Great Credit Contraction. You know, and so you go to creditcontraction.com. It's free. You can download it. Uh, it's kind of fun to go back and look at it in retrospect. I, I give an example of a transaction involving a pizza. <laughs> and it's fun that the first Bitcoin transaction involved a pizza. <laughs> um, so it's, you know, it's some fun little things in it, you know. Is that uh, so? The first, so the first Bitcoin transaction, consumer-wise? Well, 10,000 Bitcoins for two pizzas, right? Um, and, and that actually took place in my hometown, ironically, uh, where I grew up. So, but, but, you know, this is, it's just, this stuff is really like, you know, short term people that don't have control over their emotions and want to just day trade versus like investors that have a long time horizon who have long time preference and, you know, because this is, this is playing out over a period of years and decades. We're just in the first decade. Like, it's just getting started. Like, we've just had the initial proof of concept. And now we're, you know, the next decade, we're going to have stuff like Lightning Network and Chami and eCash servers and, and side chains and all this stuff coming on top of Bitcoin. I mean, Bitcoin as it is, is for the last 10 years, has just been proof of concept. It's just a and, baby industry. It's just oh, it, starting. It's, yeah, it's just a total baby industry. It's just getting started. And, and yet, we see how powerful that first network effect. Oh, you might want to get some just in case it becomes something. It could become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Very understated words from Satoshi, but they're playing out exactly how he said it would. You know, yeah. it's amazing just how much foresight Satoshi had in terms of the economics and the game theory and sound money. Uh, I mean, Satoshi's birthday, you've got, you've got executive order 6102, and then you've got the re-legalized, you know, the, the, the 
closing the gold window uh, for his birthday. You've got these, these happenings. And why do they happen every four years instead of happening in a linear basis or, uh, you know, in a much more less dramatic way? Well, I would say that part of it is in order to restrict the transactional supply of Bitcoin. And when you get a supply shock like that, because the prices are set on the margins, it causes another kind of overshoot because it acts like a Veblen good or a Giffen good because it's strictly limited in amount. So, I mean, Satoshi very well could have put all of this stuff in here in specific ways and for specific reasons, understanding the economics from an Austrian school perspective, understanding the sound money and the monetary theory, and guiding the human action years in advance, right? Like years in advance. I mean, the it's amount of foresight. Foresight, right? Foresight. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is not like, this is not an accident. And those who have a, an understanding of the Austrian School of Economics and those who understand the sound money and understand some of the tech, well, they, they could have also seen this foresight and could have talked about it. Like, it, it's really funny, you know. I, I find that the harder I work and the more I study, the luckier I get. <laughs> you know, like I, didn't, well, yeah. I, like, I didn't just get lucky. I mean, seriously, like, you got to chalk it up to luck, like absolve yourself of personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. Like good, good luck with living in that type of a cognitive dissonance because you're just going to get wrecked. Because if you don't take personal responsibility with this new age and this new epoch that humanity is going through, this new great corridor and gate, I mean, this is, this is a big deal. This is the largest wealth transfer the world's ever seen. It's likely the going to happen in the shortest amount of time ever and there will probably never be another one of these that happens to humanity because we've now moved to the hardest strictest money ever with the difficulty adjustment algorithm so i mean this is like a once in a once in a species opportunity you know absent some type of extinction level event or you know, comet that strikes the scablands in the Pacific Northwest or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this is this is just huge, huge deal. It's an extraordinary time to be alive because you're right. This is a once in a species happening. I like that term because it's very accurate. Yes. Now, taking us just a little bit into the past, can the case be made that the original Bitcoin transaction was grossly underpriced? almost giveaways that investors should not be looking back to the one cent era as their guide for how far Bitcoin might fall. What is your perspective on this? Well, all of us act deliberately to bring about some ends and we value stuff in a comparative value format, goods against other goods. We throw into the mix, you know, and th this comes from Mises, we throw in the mix asymmetric knowledge that comes from uh, Hayek and also from Mises. And, and that's really what we saw in this one cent era of Bitcoin. There was just a huge amount of asymmetric knowledge. You know, Satoshi releases the Bitcoin thing on a very obscure cryptography emailing list. I mean, how many people were even interested or even knew what cryptography was? I mean, I did. Because I'd been playing with it since I was a little, little kid in right. middle school. <laughs> right. Oh, I was playing with it in middle school, you know, PGP encryption and like, and, and growing up in this new era where the internet was brand new and, and playing around with things like e-gold and gold money and digicash and uh, PGP encryption and BitTorrent and Napster, you know, all of this stuff was just a great preparatory education so that when the Holy Grail came about and was discovered, I was ready for it. And guess what? There were a lot of other people who were ready for it, like Peter Todd. You know, Peter Todd had sent emails to Adam Back clear back in the mid-90s on the cryptography email list. And, oh, is it any surprise that Peter Todd's like a Bitcoin core developer? You know, and then we've got other people like GMAX and Peter Woola and Matt Corallo, uh, you know, like, and so there, there was just a lot of asymmetric information and asymmetric knowledge. But because people have, through very altruistic means, like myself, have educated 
many millions of people on this topic. Now that asymmetric knowledge uh, is not, the disparity is not quite as great. And so, you know, there's still billions of people who don't get it or live in cognitive dissonance and like, mm -hmm. I believe in fiat money or whatever. <laughs> right. um, you know, I believe in chartalism. Well, regression theory of money from Mises. But who wants to read books that are this thick right. and dense and complicated? You know, you don't want to do the work. You're just going to get wrecked because you, you're, you're operating with, with inferior tools, inferior ideas and knowledge up in your head. And so you get out competed by those that, that are able to calculate correctly economically. And one of the things we learn from the pricing system from Mises is that those who calculate correctly have gains and those who calculate incorrectly have losses. And that's just, and Bitcoin is just going to force this type of reckoning on the world because we have huge amounts of misallocated capital, uh, governmental interference, illegal tender laws. Uh, I mean, the World Reserve Settlement currency and the entire fiat system with euros and yens and dollars, it is all built on a complete illusion. Right. Like I write about in my book, I mean, this is, it doesn't even have a definition. It doesn't collapse. It just evaporates into nothing. Just poof, bye-bye goes the Ponzi scam, you know, with Social Security and pension Guaranteed Benefit Corporation and Medicare and Medicaid and all the European social nets, like because there's a change in the economics of violence with asymmetric encryption and now getting applied with being able to transfer value over a communications channel with Bitcoin. I mean, the, it's a new epic, great gate of, of history that humanity is going through. And there's going to be a lot up for grabs. There is a lot up for grabs all at once. Like, who's going to actually have the, the fox? Who, who's going to catch the rabbit? Is probably going to be hodlers of last resort because they're just buying and accumulating and they're never selling. They never get shaken out of their position. They're equity-based, can't be seized or confiscated. They're possessing their own private keys, doing it properly. You know, good luck, good luck, like, competing with that. And you're right. It's it's very fortunate, and um, it's it's shame on people that don't know about this already because they're not economically um, versed. People such as yourself that that really are that came up economically focused. Myself, I came up not economically focused. Well, you know, well yeah, but but but, but but why? But why is that? It's right. because it's because I'm reading big, thick economics books instead of watching the Flintstones. You know what I'm saying? Like there's a like people have priorities in how they allocate their most important asset, which is their time. Yeah. You know, and then and then how they allocate their health. You know, I like I I don't drink alcohol. I don't I don't even drink coffee. I have a very clean diet. I take very good care of my health, so I'm able to think clearly. Mm -hmm. Right. Like mm -hmm. my brain works. Right. You know, I sleep a lot. You know, I, I try to take care of myself. And, and so I have the human capital, the hardware to apply the software of the thinking, you know, by consuming the books instead of watching Flintstones or whatever the thing is. I mean, peop, I, I bet if people actually kept a tally of how much time they spend on different things, it would just blow them away, you know, and I mean, I look at a book and it's like, oh, that book's going to take me eight hours. Oh, the Bitcoin standard, that's going to take about 12 hours mm -hmm. to read. You know, great book. You know, so are you going to read the Bitcoin standard with your 12 hours? Is that how you're going to allocate your capital? Or are you going to watch a season of whatever ding dong the Kardashian show is yeah, on right? Amazon Prime or on TV or whatever? And also... I mean, I don't have cable, so guess what I've done with my with money that most people would allocate to a cable bill? I bought Bitcoin, of course, <laughs> right? You bought the dip, and <laughs> no, and I mean, it, it's all fun and games when you're spending a hundred dollars a month on cable and Bitcoin's a dollar. That's a hundred Bitcoins a month, right? Right, which is now like you know that's a that's twelve hundred Bitcoins in a year, right. you know, and let's. Let's give it five thousand bucks. You're talking what? What would that be? Almost uh, six million dollars, mm -hmm. and that that was just one year, right? And like, Bitcoin's been around ten years. Yep. So I mean, 
the, the return on investment that you get from investing in yourself, in your health and in your mind and in the ideas that you populate your mind with, and then, you know, hopefully getting your heart like focused in the right direction, your emotions, you know, cause you're, that's what drives your mind is like Bitcoin is bringing order. It is bringing order to this planet because this planet has been out of order because we've had a financial system that's been out of order and undefined. And now we're bringing sound money and hard money and it's going to bring order back to this planet. And, you know, like you want to dink around like watching the Kardashians or, or whatever, you're, you're going to be cl cleaning toilets or, or doing something, right? Like you're not going to have the free time because, I mean, it is, it is going to be strict on those resources, very strict yeah, on the resources. Yeah, and it's moving so swiftly. And I just think, you know, in, in society, you're educated. When you're brought up in the, you know, the public education system, you're, you're sort of programmed. You really are. And you're programmed to go along with what everybody else is doing. And then they show you what everybody else is doing. So people, it's tough to wake up to the fact that maybe what you've been taught and what you believe and what you rely on um, you need to look in a different direction and you need to think for yourself. And I think that that's the challenge that mass populations have right now in even accepting Bitcoin, because once it's accepted, it's going to be yeah, on a massive gonna... scale. It's going to be so expensive that yeah. it's unfortunate. Well, it's, think... you know, it, it, I think it happens one hodler at a time, but I went to public school, like, mm -hmm. you know, like, you're like, why? What? <laughs> I, I mean, I'm still able to think. Of course. Like, you are. I'm, I'm like, but I guess perhaps part of it is because I've sought out solutions, right? I'm very practical and very pragmatic. You know, I'm not just going to do something because somebody tells me to. Like, I've always kind of had this ethos of don't trust, verify. Like, I've always kind of, you know, taken in all the information, processed and attempted to synthesize it and then made my own decisions, you know? So I've always kind of had that personal responsibility streak in there too. And now it's, uh, now it's just getting, it's getting crazy. Cause I mean, with backed and institutional money, I mean, the, the rate of speed at which capital could come into this uh -huh. relative to its current size and the amount of capital that's out there. I mean, it's just, it's so insane. We, we now have $257 trillion of debt. I mean, that's like Chancellor on the second brink of bailouts, right? Like that's the, that's the newspaper that Satoshi put the headline in the Genesis block of Bitcoin. We have $87 trillion more debt than we did at, in the financial crisis of 2007-2008. Like I don't know where people think the, the world economy gets the productive ability to service that amount of debt. Plus, who knows how much more we have in terms of unfunded government liabilities or other uh, liabilities of that sort, like pension fund, defined benefit pension funds and uh, plans and stuff like that. So, I mean, a Bitcoin white paper. Yeah, you know, you know it's surprising. <laughs> the numbers that are released too um, are on the the bright side. So, actually, is that real? You know what I mean? If, if you know, once well, this crashes, what will I mean, reality be? Well, that's another problem is, like, how do we establish what is real in terms of information theory? Like, Bitcoin creates, it, it creates an anchor for truth because we have proof of work behind it. You know, in this day and age where we can just, uh, you know, have CGI computer effects and, and, Rewashing, re rewriting history, and you know, like edit, like edits on Wikipedia, and like removing like the changes that happened, and whitewashing, and all of this stuff. Like all of a sudden, you know, there's this gigantic memory hole that exists, and then there's now there's Bitcoin, so you can cryptographically prove that something existed. You know, like. Like I, I mean, I've used it. I've taken PDFs, run it through the sh through the SHA two fifty six algorithm, gotten a hash, put that hash into an op return mm -hmm. in a Bitcoin transaction. So now I have proof that that PDF existed at a certain point in time. Right. I mean, Bitcoin's Bitcoin's going to totally redefine how we establish trust. 
and what we believe what we actually believe is true like somebody's somebody says xyz in in five years ago well now you can cryptographically prove that they said it five years ago so in terms of the historical facts uh, we're going to have a whole new way of determining verifiability you know when you want to make edits to wikipedia it needs to be credible and verifiable uh, well instead of using things like books or whatever that could just be rewritten uh, now we can now we can actually take the book hash it put it into the bitcoin transaction we know that that book existed a hundred years ago right i mean bitcoin is going to really change a lot of stuff when it comes to history audits on companies auditability uh just the way we establish trust in general i mean because people are like oh bitcoin's in search of a problem it's like no this planet's yeah. got a big problem <laughs> this this planet does not have accurate history it does not have accurate way of keeping records uh it doesn't have accurate monetary system i mean we got all types of problems down here we sure do and the difference definitely is the verification i think that's the word that's the basis for what's been missing all along is how do you verify that it's the truth what you're being told is the truth and that's where all of our problems lie because many times that's not the case so yeah well what was what was the first thing that the people at enron did they went and started shredding the past yep. right and then like I mean, anytime somebody wants to perpetuate a giant fraud, the first thing they want to do is attack the past. Well, guess what? Bitcoin's going to stand there as a sentinel with proof of work behind it protecting the past. I mean, it, it's, and it's not just Bitcoin transactions that it can protect. You could take millions of documents, hash them all through a, a Merkle tree, get a, get a Merkle root, Put that hash into the Bitcoin transaction. Now you can cryptographically prove that entire Merkle tree existed at that point in time. I mean, this is this is going to be just it's going to be great for humanity, but not great for control freak, power hungry, uh, fraud con men. You know, it's they're they're going to they're going to have it's bad that. news for those guys. Yeah, very bad news. <laughs> Trace, it is always amazing to have you on the show. Thank you so much for coming on today. Please tell everybody how to follow your work. Oh, yeah. So at Trace Mayer on Twitter, where I have some fun, like our president. Yeah. <laughs> and, sure. uh, and then also um, the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast, so www.bitcoin.kn. And I interview top people in the Bitcoin space and, and have a lot of fun there. And there's hundreds of interviews in the archives. And I try to do them in a way that, you know, people go listen to the archives, they'll still learn a lot and it'll be helpful for them. So, you know, hey, you can always do that. Trace, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for being with you. Mr. Trace Mayer, he is a pioneer Bitcoin investor and the host of the very popular Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast. For cryptocurrencies, the future of digital money show, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. Check out trending interviews right now. Harry Dent, the famous deflationist who predicts single-digit silver and has now changed his tune. Greg Manorino with a Noel Holds Bard interview where he lays out his top ideas. Jim Rogers outlines exactly how the crash will happen. And Charles Nenner on major stock market crashes and gold crashes. Portfolio Wealth Global has written and published the only report online showcasing how the internal division within the U.S. between federal and state, Democrats and Republicans, could be exploited by China and Russia. You must go to Portfolio PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash attack and PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash drama. The mainstream media keeps it hidden from you.